Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're, I'm going to start a, right on time because I want to give Layla as much time as possible. And um, I want to welcome everybody back from the summer. Hope you all had a uh, great time. Got a lot of um, sleeping and rejuvenating in. And uh, that you're all, I know you're, many of you are working on ICRA papers, so I appreciate you taking a break to come down here. We, uh, we're, we're starting the series, and I also want to welcome all of our online visitors who are tuning in or will tune in through video later to, uh, to the CPARS series of People and Robots. And I want to thank Ron for organizing and putting, putting all this together. We are, we are just putting together the, the season for CPAR and Dreams, so this will be um, posted very soon with all, the, uh, with all the, the, the full series. But we're delighted to actually to start today with one of the most esteemed, most accomplished of our own, f our own students. <laughs> she's, a, she's, a, she's a Cal Bear, and she was here in the 90s? A while ago. 2000s. Uh, 99 to 2003. All right, all right. Yeah. and uh, James Landay's group? Yeah. Yes. So she did her undergrad here. Then uh, she went to the dark side for a little while, but we won't talk about that. But yeah. then, no, she did. She did. She studied with Cliff Nast and did some really interesting work um, in the psychology department at Stanford. And then um, she has her her, her uh, resume reads like a who's who of uh, where to go and I mean all the interesting places in the in the valley. She has Xerox Park. She was at IBM. She was at Nokia Labs. She was at Willow Garage which is a crucial during that, that really, really inspirational period. And then uh, Google X. And uh, now she's back in the UC system. And we're uh, delighted to, to have her back in the program. And she's actually a member, a faculty member of CPAR. So please welcome Layla. Thank you. All right, it's good to be back. Um, I will admit that I actually got lost coming here, which is really embarrassing, and it means that I'm not visiting Berkeley nearly enough. So hopefully you'll see more of me this year. Uh, I joined UC Santa Cruz one year ago um, in July, um, which is crazy. So I'd been in industry for about eight years. I'm going to present to you a lot of the stuff that I did there and then tell you a little bit about what we're doing now, because the reason I came up here was because it might be fun to find some projects for us to do together. I'm just starting up my new lab, the Reembodied Cognition Lab in the psych department there. Um, and there's some really great HCI folks there, but I know there's also some really great HCI folks here who could be really fun to work with. So um, consider this an invitation. Um, a lot of folks are scared of robots, so I always start with this. And this may be preaching to the choir, but I would argue that you know everyone's like, when are the robots coming? And I say, they've been here for a really long time, and they're hiding in plain sight. <laughs> right? So the ATM that you got cash on, the automatic transmission on my car that I use to get up here, the Nest thermostat that's learning, your, supposedly learning what you want, <laughs> and predicting what you want, and changing the temperature in your house for you, um, they're all sensing, planning, and acting. Right? They're using robotics. They may not look like robots, but they're using robotics to get things done uh, for us, and it's kind of great that we don't even notice that they're there. Um, there's lots of robot-y, robot, you know, consumer products out there that watch windows, wake you up in the morning, and then run away when you hit the snooze button, give you really annoying news feeds uh, <laughs> by voice. And you know, there's been a mix of successes and failures that I think we have a lot to learn from, um, from industry as well as academia. Um, these are the robots that live in my home right now. Um, this little guy sucks dirt. This guy scoops my kitty's poop every single time he goes, and this one cuts the grass every single day. They're amazing, <laughs> and they're not expensive anymore, and they kind of work most of the time. Um, they still need a lot of wrangling, and you need to have a bit of patience with them, um, but when they work, they're great, right? Because there's no way that I do all those things that frequently or that well ever. So they've been kind of nice, and I'd call them domestic robots, even if they don't look like Rosie from the Jetsons, right? Um, I kind of want to tie this back to what we all know here, right? In human computer interaction, there was this period of time where we went from mainframes to personal computers. And Xerox PARC and SRI and Apple and all these places were a very big part of that. That hasn't happened yet for robots. They're still kind of, you know, big honking things that only people with robotics PhDs can wrangle. Um, and I think it'd be really great if we could get them to the point where everyday normal people who don't necessarily need years of training should be able to use them, right? That would be great and that would be powerful. So um, Ken Salisbury over at that other school on the other side of the bay built this wooden robot. <laughs> um, literally the gears were cut out of wood, just laser cut. This is the PR1, Personal Robot 1. And of course it's you know the dream of making the personal robot that does everything and runs around and grabs stuff. 
Um, at Willow Garage, we made PR2, um, stole a couple of PhD students from his lab, um, <laughs> Eric Berger and Keenan Weirbeck, and they built a metallic version that was much bigger that happens to live here. Um, I think maybe a couple of them are here now? Just one? Okay. Are, how do they behave being there? Okay. Good. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, the company doesn't exist anymore to support them. Um, so PR2s were, in case you haven't seen them, they're about half a million dollar mobile manipulation platforms, weigh about 500 pounds. They're really great as a research platform. Nobody wants these in their homes. <laughs> um, and that's something that we had to learn the hard way. But I think we learned a lot of things along the way as we were doing that. So I'm going to take you down one path of a bunch of lessons that we learned um, in, in this exploration. Uh, Ken mentioned the Willow Garage for me was, um, so far, it was the best job I ever had. Um, Steve Cousins, I saw, is coming to give a talk later on. He was my boss there. Um, and you're going to hear lots of other stories, I'm sure, from him. Uh, but this place was amazing. We were doing open source personal robotics. I was doing research with collaborating with a whole bunch of people. Um, and honestly, I was more productive there as a researcher than I ever was at that other school um, across the bay. <laughs> um, and it was great. Um, and actually, what I've been trying to do is to figure out how to take the best parts of that and make that happen now through the consulting and academic work that I do. Um, so we were supposed to be making these robots, right? These are big honking mobile manipulation platforms. Um, and they look like this. Um, but there was actually a Skunk Works project that was very much inspired by Eric's work, actually. And it was in, he was in grad school here. Um, that looked at something else. So I apologize to those of you who've heard this story before, but for those who haven't, it's a helpful transition. Uh, this is what my coworker Dallas used to look like. Dallas was an amazing electrical engineer who lived and worked in Indiana. Um, but we really, really wanted him working for our company because he was just that strong. Um, and so he refused to move to California because our real estate prices are too high. Um, so he was always a voice in a box on a table, right? And these should look familiar, like you all up there are just like an eyeball in the sky with the microphone, right? Um, and you can only have so much presence with that kind of instantiation. And so, you know, our double E team would often be looking at CAD and figuring out where the layout should go. And they'd yell at each other and yell at each other. And if Dallas is something that they didn't like, they would just hang up on him. And uh, <laughs> that's a very stark example of not having enough presence, right? Where your, your coworkers don't respect you enough to literally hear what you have to say. They're like, oh, we just lost the connection. Um, not cool. So uh, one weekend, because he and his buddies like to build battle bots, they hacked together this little like Skype on a cart um, <laughs> where you could see his face. That's not Dallas. That's our other friend who's messing around with it. But if you see someone's face, you're a little less likely to shut them off, right? Because it feels a little more rude. Um, and this was fine, except that a lot of times they would you know, forget to bring him to the meeting. Um, or there would actually be an impromptu meeting in the hallway where they're really making the decision and they just like, he wouldn't be there because it wasn't a scheduled meeting, right? It just happened because everyone ran into each other and decided to pick the fight there. Uh, so this was a, all right, but it wasn't a great solution. Um, so what they did one weekend when they were putting their battle bots together was they stole some body parts from the big PR2. And Dallas came in looking like this. So that's actually a caster from the PR2 in the back, two passives in the front, and that's Dallas. Um, it, you know, it's not a commercial product. <laughs> um, but you know, now when Aton doesn't answer Dallas's emails, Dallas can literally roll into his office and block the doorway until Aton does answer the email question that he sent earlier. You can literally get in people's faces, and you're much more present as a coworker when you do stuff like that. Um, I, honestly, I thought this was super nerdy the first time I saw it. I was like, yeah, I've seen that before. Whatever, this isn't new. Um, but after a while, Dallas actually started to feel like a real person to me. He was actually a real coworker, which was pretty awesome. So we decided to build um, a few more and then field them in places where people don't love robots for the sake of being robots. So these, uh, they're a little more polished, but really these are all like consumer off the shelf pieces that were put together. Um, this has existed before. This guy should look familiar over here. Um, and he was the first. Uh, so when you know John and Eric were making uh, the personal roving presence, right? that was, God, more than 10 years predating what we were doing. right? So the hardware that we were doing was not new. Um, other folks have done this. This is Wayne Gretzky's robot that Shuman Jai worked on, where they're using it for kids who were hospitalized and couldn't go to school. So it's like a little tabletop version. And there's been lots more in places like Korea, UCSD, um, HP Labs. and. They were cool, but the Wi-Fi wasn't great. It was hard to keep them up for long periods of time. And now that the networks are more robust, I think we're able now to make these work longer term and more reliably. Um, and so now we're seeing consumer products in spaces like hospitals and offices, um, where people are using these to be remotely present every day. 
Um, there is a different design direction that you could go in, right? Instead of being Skype on a stick, you could be an Android, right? So Ishiguro made his Geminoid that looks just like him, so he can teleop his robot body anywhere in the world. Um, the only catch is that his grad students could also teleop his Geminoid to do whatever they want it to do and say whatever they want him to say. Um, and that's a little weird and can get kind of expensive, but it is a design direction you could go in, right? It just scales in a different way. This is the telenoid, which is supposed to be the more abstract version of that. You know, babies haven't formed into people yet, and so this could be anyone. Um, but given, depending on your aesthetic, it may or may not work <laughs> for what you're trying to achieve. Um, but it is a direction that you could go in, right? They don't have to look like Skype on a stick. Just for now, they do. Um, if you catch me saying these words, this is what I mean. If I say remote pilot, I mean the person operating the robot. If I say local, I mean the person who's locally, physically local uh, to the robot. But we just made those words up because <laughs> they're useful. Um, you can use whatever you want to use. Um, we fielded these because we wanted to know would they actually work with normal people? Um, and what would they do with them? So we actually put them in more than three companies over time, but this is the first time we published little bits of it. Um, and Min Kyung Lee and I were following these robots around for many, many weeks and months and even years later um, at companies all over the Bay Area. Their physical robot bodies were all here, like, you know, Bay Area, but their remote operators were all over the world. Um, and it turns out, like, that works, but actually, you know, if you're in Singapore and you're operating a robot in Mountain View, that means you're usually going to work at about 2 a.m. at Mountain View time, which means you meet the cleaning staff usually and sometimes freak them out because um, we didn't brief them <laughs> on the robots. Uh, so we learned a lot about how to manage time zones also. It's not easy, because um, that still matters. People do kind of what they do normally when they talk to each other in the office. I think what's more interesting than you know what they do and what they say is where they're doing it. So if you look at the locations where people are using these robots, um, right, imagine a lot of these video, video conferencing systems, you know, big projected displays, really nice microphone setups, they tend to be in um, either offices or conference rooms or like boardrooms, right? They're very formal communication spaces. These robots are used in different places, right? They're used in places where more informal communication takes place. This is like by the coffee machine or just as you're walking down the hallway. And that's where a lot of informal work actually happens and rapport building between team members. So in short, a lot of the things that we saw here were kind of different from normal video conferencing, right? People were using these robots to do a few things that I'll, I'll talk about in turn. One of them is just showing up. So like you putting your butt in that seat right now shows a commitment to this group of people. It shows a commitment to this project. It shows a commitment to this community. Um, and same thing with these robots, right? If you bother to show up in robot, you're visibly committed to being part of that team. And that actually matters for folks like Mozilla, right? Where their, their program manager was actually in Toronto, um, even though his whole team was in Mountain View. And they felt like he cared more because he bothered to show up in robot instead of just listen um, on a, a video display. Um, also, <laughs> you can capture and maintain attention, right? You can block that doorway until someone answers your question. Um, there are ways around this if you're the local. Um, actually, these old robots were a little bit noisy, so you could hear them coming down the hallway. Um, and often, if I did and I knew it was Dallas and I knew he had a question I didn't want to talk about, um, I would run out of the building <laughs> because he didn't have arms to open doors with. Um, so we could totally get away from him. And the last one, which is, I think, the most important, uh, is building social connections. So, a major breakdown that you see happen across remote teams is that they just sort of either don't care about each other or eventually they start losing respect for one another. They're like, what are those guys over there for? Why are we paying them a salary? Right? Why, are, why are they still on the, the books? Um, and when you hang out with each other, these guys are not playing pool, but they are heckling the guys playing pool. Right? You start to get to know each other more as people. Um, you get to know their interests. You even get to meet their kids because they happen to be in a different time zone and the kids want to be on sleep. Yeah. Oh, with their mobile phones. With their mobile. How important people must feel. Yeah, they have I have better places to be. Right, right. Yeah, we, we like. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, we want to be important. We want to be loved. <laughs> I, I think this is very attractive for making us feel popular. That's my hypothesis, right? It's like, I have so many friends on my phone, and there's only a few of you here, so I'm going to spend time with my friends on my phone. It has to be tested, which we haven't done, which is why I'm saying it's a hypothesis. <laughs> That's my hypothesis. That's the one that I would test. 
but yeah, we do. We have this need to be and remotely it's present. You just the latest news from yesterday to news mm. that Berkeley, I think Berkeley or San Francisco, is going to penalize you for texting well. For te booking and texting. Oh, that's good. Really? Yeah, so I've almost hit and multiple pedestrians doing that. that. Yeah. yeah, they should do it for bicycling it's too. Safety, it is actually. I just heard, I think it's in Korea, they have signs um, before you step onto the, the street right. that say, like, put your phone down. Right. No texting no, while I'm, crossing. I'm guilty of uh, what you <laughs> call it, uh, you know, I don't go to the white lines. Oh, J oh, yeah, we all do so that. I shouldn't do that myself. Just don't do it while texting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I'm not texting. Yeah, it's really but not safe. <laughs> is it silenced? <laughs> yeah, we. I think we just like to be able to have everyone at our fingertips all the time, and I'm not sure that's a good thing. I think so. Oh, no screen time for you either. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good thing. I mean, having moved to Santa Cruz now, there's a lot more talk if about. You hit me in Singapore, I was oh yeah, the phones are. The table and there were people talking, you know, having meal together. Yeah, and remotely. And on the phone. Yeah, I mean, there are you know there there are like our real loved ones, right, who don't live in the same places we're at. We are going to get into that actually a bunch more. So jump in anytime. Actually, everybody here, jump in. Um, yeah, these are these are good. Um, I think the coolest thing, actually, I, I'm just gonna yeah, let's go with that. So, we worked on robots. We still work on robots. I call myself sort of a roboticist, but really, these robots have you nothing. That is a robot. <laughs> now I do, because there is autonomy. Um, before it was not really right. It was just a remote control, like an RC car. But because there's bits of autonomy in it these days, I think it's getting to be more of a robot. And that makes it interesting. But I think the coolest thing about these is that in the best case scenario, we forget that the robot's there. right? It's like when I talk on the phone to my grandma, I'm just talking to my grandma. It's not about the phone. I don't care what phone I'm carrying. I don't care what phone she's using. We're just talking. right? And that's how these should be, too. They should just disappear. Um, it should just feel like the person's there, and you're just hanging out. Right, as opposed to like operating machinery. Um, right now, these interfaces are not awesome, so they still kind of feel like you're operating machinery, just so you have a sense for what this looks like. Um, if you were driving one of these robots, you would drag your body around using this graphical user interface, which is very video game-like. Um, there is a joystick controller for it also. You can also use um, first-person shooter game buttons or arrow keys. Um, and there, there's a lot of debate over, you know, how do you decrease the cognitive load of operating these so that you can just forget about it, right? Like, I should be able to move my robot body just as just as unconsciously and easily as I can move my own body. That's hard um, from a design perspective. Did I see? <laughs> you have a question? No. You're good? Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to nip this in the bud because it's, it's going to come up. Um, everybody says, you totally ripped off Shellbot. Oh my god, you stole this idea from the Big Bang Theory. No, we didn't. <laughs> they took our robot. That's literally our robot. So they saw they they do their homework. They're really good, you know, good at doing homework on nerds. Um, we had posted one tiny YouTube video on the internet that no one watched. Um, and somehow the producers of the show actually saw it. And so they gave us a call and they're like, hey, we want to use your robot for an episode. We have an idea for an episode. And uh, Kurt and Dallas, who built that robot, the two BattleBot buddies, um, they were so tickled pink because Kurt actually, like, he loves the Bing Bang Theory so much that the theme song for their show was his wedding processional song <laughs> before they ever called us. He loves them. So it was like, it was like better than going to Disneyland. Um, for Kurt. So they actually flew down to LA um, and shot this whole thing down there. Uh, and Steve Wozniak was on this episode. So if you haven't seen it, it's the Shell Butt episode. It's a lot of fun. Sheldon decides that like the world's too much of a dangerous place, so he's just going to lie in bed all day and operate his robot body around because it's much too dangerous out there, which is, sure, an extreme that you could totally take this to. Also, if you put t-shirts on them like that, you can't see your feet. That's not a good operation um, way to do it. <laughs> uh, also, 
The spin out that came out of this work uh, called Suitable Technologies, they don't call these robots. They call these remote presence devices, right? Because it's not about the robot, it's about being present. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you might want to use them. Maybe you're Edward Snowden and you don't want to be physically in the United States because people might come and get you. Whereas if they come and get your robot body, who cares, right? They can, they can have that one. Um, so what kinds of things happened? And I'll talk about a few studies, but feel free to, again, jump in and interrupt whenever you want. Um, this is a little more extensive work that we did in the field work, uh, fielding robots around uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, the robot operators were all over the place, just like before. Most of them were a little bit closer, more domestic locations, but there still were a few that were international. Um, we did qualitative field work here, so it was a combination of interviews, surveys, observations. Um, sometimes people just wouldn't tell us anything, so we even had to put out like secret ballot boxes where they could like slip little notes in there and they'd all complain about each other <laughs> and draw nasty pictures of each other too. Um, so what went wrong um, I think is just as important as what went right. So one of the big things that goes wrong is I am a remote coworker and I log into the robot and I roll into this meeting and Ken and I have a conversation and then I decide I'm going to hang up the phone. And now to me that felt like I just ended the conversation appropriately. To Ken it feels like I just turned off a dead robot body and left it for him to deal with. Uh, and that's rude <laughs> because you're the one who didn't bother to show up, right? Like why, why do I have to take care of your robot body? So there's this problem that would happen a lot where people would just leave dead robot bodies everywhere um, and they would lose charge and then not work and then people would complain. So there's that. There's also this other kind of cool thing that happened where people would start to feel so present in the robot that they really felt like it was their body. And so if you touch that robot body, it felt like a violation of personal space. Um, and we had we made this mistake of having volume buttons up here because there's you know off the shelf speakers and so people would be like you're too loud and then poke the volume button down which kind of feels like your coworker's poking you in the face um, and that's not cool. There's also a big run stop right because we put those on robots but to a consumer who sees a big red button the first thing they're going to do is hit it which kills all power to your motors and it's also not nice. So there are all these affordances that we had to remove <laughs> um, because of this and because people started feeling like. It is me, right? Like, why are you touching me? That's not cool, especially in California. Um, there's a lot of metaphors that we can use here. I'm going to gloss over the theory because I think the data is more interesting. But metaphors that we use right now are things like in video conferencing, we're talking across spaces. Um, or maybe we're talking through a window, right? So Seattle is now connected to San Francisco through a window, and that's kind of cool. But the problem is that these are mobile. They're rolling all over the place. Windows don't move through space. Windows stay still, and they're attached to the building. Um, so, thankfully, uh, because there's movies like Avatar out now, we can say Avatar and normal people know what we mean. Um, and there's been lots of other metaphors like it's my proxy, right, it's my avatar. They come from sci-fi, but people can now kind of understand what that means. Maybe that robot's like an avatar. Um, in the best case scenario, again, right, they treat these as if they were really there. So Jonathan is getting the personal space that he would get if he was at this standing meeting in person too, right? People aren't crowding him or like putting their arm on his head as they do in other sites. Um, there's sort of human-oriented behavior, uh, but then sometimes people just get too close. They start poking in your cameras because they want to see your components, um, and that starts feeling like an invasion of space. So this is actually what one guy said to his buddy uh, when his buddy got too close and was sticking his fingers in the camera. Um, there's also people who talk about these as like, oh, it's just a phone. It's just another device, um, which is fine too, but it's a different way of making sense of the technology. Um, and another interesting thing that happened was anytime there was a breakdown in an interaction, they would depersonalize it, right? So they wouldn't say like, John needs a mute button. They'd say the robot needs a mute button. So they would sort of distance him from the machine and blame the machine for all those mistakes. So this is actually a guy who logged in. His camera is crooked uh, when he logged in. So he thought his eyeball was forward. His eyeball is actually 90 degrees to the left. Um, and therefore, when he went forward, he was super confused about why the body moved so weird, and so he zigzagged his way through this beautiful open floor plan space, banging into his coworker's desk, and then getting embarrassed and laughing really loud, <laughs> um, which was super disruptive. So that's why his coworkers were like, dude needs a mute button, make him shut up, right? Um, so that wasn't great. A few other things happen behaviorally. These are not things you would see in surveys. These are things you only see when you go out in the field. Um, he's, the manager is resting his feet on his, uh, direct reports base, um, which is kind of like me like putting my feet up on your knees, right? Which is kind of weird. Um, and so it, it affords foot resting. 
Um, so now the new industrial design versions of, the, of these do not afford foot resting. <laughs> it would be hard to rest your feet on the, on the beams. Um, so they would treat it as an it, right? It's like a piece of furniture that's just moving around. Um, this is the best, but again, this is not what we got at all of the sites. Um, I think the most interesting metaphor we kept hearing was actually using a beam is like interacting with a person with a disability. They don't have arms, um, so they can't open doors themselves. So I have to open arms, I to open doors for them. Um, because their cameras aren't great, sometimes what they would do is draw really big on the whiteboard or they would over articulate what they're saying because they assume that the person can't hear them very well. Um, or they'll help them you know, navigate down the hallway to get to the meeting room because they assume that they can't do it themselves, which is kind of interesting. And sometimes they'd even compare it to like, well, it's easier to hold the door open for a beam than it is to hold the door open for someone in a wheelchair. So they'd make the direct comparisons. And even the pilots would say, you know, when I get to a Wi-Fi dead zone and I die, I would like to have a medical bracelet so that I can tell the locals, hey, push my body forward a few feet so I can get on Wi-Fi again, right? Um, and they were the ones who came up with words like medical bracelet, which was, was interesting, I think, because there are some comparisons that we can make because these robots are differently able, right, than, than able-bodied humans. I think, you know, looking at where there were breakdowns and where there were not breakdowns, one thing that was really consistent was that it wasn't so much about, like, which metaphor was right. It was more about the people at the site agreeing on which metaphor they were going to use. So if they all agreed that we're going to treat it human-like um, between the locals and the remote pilots, then they tended to give it more personal space, the pilots took more responsibility for their actions, and it was all fine. If the people at the site all agreed that it's just a machine, right, like you can poke the buttons as much as you want, you can turn up and down my volume, I don't care, and I'm probably going to take a little less responsibility for my actions because it's just like a race car. Um, so there are important behavioral differences here, but really when the social interaction breaks down, that's when the whole thing breaks down. That's when these things get shoved into closets and then never used again. Um, and I think the biggest difference is really about just agreement between the local and the remote people about which metaphor they're going to use. And a lot of times it doesn't, they don't align, so you have to sort of push them there. Yeah. What is the age that you are aiming Oh, big, very big, <laughs> yeah. This is actually, I'm going to skip to there. Uh, this, this one we're going to talk about <laughs> first. So we actually, we tried preschoolers, and we tried working with folks who were over 70, I think. And the design of the systems had to change a lot. And they had to prove that they were valuable before they'd be willing to use it. But yeah, I think the ones that we made, right, they're really nerdy looking. They're great for like high tech in the valley, people who are software engineers, um, but they were not designed, right, with everybody in mind. Yeah, Anka. Can you go back to the metaphors? Yeah. So what do you think can be done, I, I'm sure you've done a bunch of it already, yeah. to, to establish a common metaphor, to get everyone yeah. to engage in <laughs> So since these studies were like, okay, we need to actually set the frame, right? And so what we started doing is when you start running the study, you have to over introduce the system in a specific way. And actually, um, Susan Herring over at Indiana University just finished running a study where they framed the robot differently. So they would say, it's like a person. It's like a person with disabilities. It's just a machine. And now they're looking uh, behaviorally and linguistically at how people treat the robots differently, which is kind of cool, because she's actually like figuring out causally doesn't make a difference. Um, I tend to tell people, treat it like it's a person, because I think the biggest breakdowns that happen are when the locals start messing with the machine and the person feels like it's a violation of personal space, like, that's really not okay. That's the worst breakdown. We almost had an HR incident because of that. We are in California, um, and people are sensitive about it, right? Like, you don't touch your coworkers. Same thing, you shouldn't touch their robot body if they feel like it's theirs. So I, I tend to push them more towards, like, treat it as if they're really here, right? Like, give them the space that they need. Don't put your fingers all up in their, their face, just like you wouldn't do it to a person there in person, yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember, so at, in the beginning, there was a bunch of hardware that I showed. And there were some people who made these really feminine forms with the screen right here. I don't know what they were thinking. Like, it's, it's perfect, like, eyes up here problem. Um, that's a terrible place to put the screen. Um, I think in the best case scenario, if the design goal is to make the robot disappear, you really want them to focus on who's in the robot, not so much on, like, a beautiful sculpture. Because um, that part should just 
not be important. So we tried to make it as mundane as possible in its form, but make it the most interactive where the human is. So you could do that in a lot of different ways, right? Like. So to, like enforce like personal space boundaries for a very non-anthropomorphic yeah, body. Yeah, right. It's like much more unimportant. Yeah. I mean, we could try. So I think if it had arms, <laughs> It can make a difference, right? Because it'll feel a little more like a person. It's just the arms are really expensive, as you know, uh, and really hard to control. <laughs> um, but I do think that that would be a way to give people, you know, the sense that it is there's something, someone living in there, right? Uh, Instead of that was going to be my question. A head on a stick, yeah. Uh, I mean, you're you're selling people as if they're eggs. Yeah. And ideally, in the wild, they just get it. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. The best case scenario is an end user who's never seen this thing before, by total bystander, doesn't need any instructions at all. That would be awesome. And I don't think Anka and I recently participated in a small workshop. In Fiji. Yeah. That looked Fiji. awesome. <laughs> oh my god, Anka was posting pictures. I was like, oh man, I totally want to be on the beach. Yeah, I'm super jealous. That looked like fun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a long flight. Yeah, it's a long flight. Yeah. <laughs> I think the interesting observation I made is that what you really want with these personalized robots, whether they have legs or, or arms or not, mm -hmm. that they really have to be adaptive. Yeah. Because people are different. As you go through life, you change. Yes. And especially at the older. Yeah. Yeah. want to make sure that these machines will not do more mm -hmm. than it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, the MVP. Otherwise, you will be contributing to atrophy, right. both in the muscles and the Cognitively, you yeah. You really want to adapt to the, you want to have a complementary capability mm -hmm. rather than supplementary. Right. I, I, so I, I just fell off my bike a few months ago and uh, had multiple fractures in my pelvis. So I couldn't walk for about three months. And there were so many moments when I was like, I really like a robot to come and carry my stuff. Because my hands were busy with the crutches, right? So I couldn't. It was either I walk or I can grab things. And uh, it's uh, not easy. But then you're right. Like be, The physical therapist was like, just start walking. It's going to hurt. Just walk. Like, yeah. suck it up, <laughs> do 50 minutes a day, keep going till you can get up to 30, keep going, to, yeah. And you can't take it over for them, right, because then you're going to let them just fall, but those skills fall by the wayside. Yeah. Um, I thought Andrea's question about uh, seeing the robot as a human form made it more intuitive as the human experience for you. The, a similar thing is you, you mentioned that they sometimes could be like, kind of a differently abled yeah. human. Yeah. Yeah, I, that would be really interesting. There's some uh, there's some artists in Australia who had a really interesting exhibit that was like that. Actually, the two robots were wheelchairs, um, and they were like lovers that were separated or something, and they were trying to find each other. It was it was actually a really interesting exhibit, and people um, felt for them, I think, more immediately. Uh, because we kind of understood a, a little bit of what that could be like, more so than like a box on wheels. I think that'd be super interesting. Yeah. One of the subjects there was thinking about boxing, you know, this experiment. Yeah, with, uh, the storytelling. Boxing. Yeah. Yeah, but it was like this cardboard box that would say help. Yeah. And it, like, people would pick it up and then they would, it would ask them to carry it around and then show it things. And things. Yeah. And that really well. It is brilliant. That is the most socially apt robot I have ever seen. That one and um, Casey Kinzer's Tweenbot yeah. is freaking brilliant. Mm -hmm. So if, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's, it's literally like a brown paper bag with a cute face made of Sharpie. Smiley face. And it has a little sign that says, I'm trying to get to this intersection in Manhattan, and all it does is roll forward. So it's not, you know, mechanically very functional. Boxy was a box. Just a piece of cardboard, a cardboard box. With very big eyes that looked very childlike, and a cute little voice that would, you know, plead for help. 
Um, yeah, Casey Kinzer's one was also really tiny, super cute, big eyes, little flag, um, and it just said where it's trying to go, and they dropped it in the middle of Manhattan, and people there are busy, right? Like, they're not used to, like, stopping and helping, but it made it all the way to its intersection because people would pick it up and point it in the right direction, and then somebody else would come along and pick it up and point it in the right direction. So it navigated using social, social skills, right, instead of mechanical skills, um, right? There was no slam <laughs> on that robot. <laughs> there were no sensors on that robot. It just rolled and was, was adorable and was clear about its goals, which I think was actually really important, right? Like Boxy would try to, it had a purpose, right, which was to get stories out of people. Um, and same with this thing, it's to show that if you tell people what you're trying to do, they're gonna help you do it. Like we are social animals. Um, and actually, I've been, yeah, a lot of the work that I do is looking at, like, how do we improve the social skills of these robots? And people will say, like, oh, that's nice. You make them smile, um, which is not the point, right? The point of having social skills is that you get things done um, with the help of others, right? And if you can be really clear about what your goals are and what you're trying to do and how it might help other people, they'll help you, right? Like, there's all these psych experiments that show, like, if you're standing in line, like a long line, waiting to make photocopies, if you just tell people, like, oh, you know, I'm really sorry, but I need to make copies. Could I cut in front of you? Um, instead of just saying, like, could I cut in front of you? If you say, because you need to make copies, for some reason, they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Just go ahead. Right. Like that. <laughs> and I'll be like, let me help you get that pen. Right? Which is something John Candy and Dave Nguyen did, which is brilliant. Um, we're just, we do it because we're social animals. And I think that's fine. Like, we should leverage the people around us. And we should leverage the robots around us. Um, yeah. I love, I love that line of thought. We should totally make a wheelchair robot. Um, I think that the design, the American and the German design direction of making these like very capable, you know, masculine, like, functional robots is actually off-putting to people and probably hurts their likelihood of being helped, right? If you had a little more approachability and humility, I bet people would be more likely to work with those machines than like, I can do it myself, back off human, right? Um, be a little more like a teammate. Yeah? Uh, I have a question. So is there any work being done towards conveying um, body language? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you should talk to Anka about that. Uh, there's, yeah. What, what kind of body language, I guess? I shouldn't. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Like, if you're talking to someone, like, if you're a robot, like, you know, it depends whether, because you're just seeing, like, an image, right, which is, like, yeah. like stuff. What about, like, oh, like, right. Are, like, you talk a lot with, like, your hands. Yes, like, yes. Or, Yes. Like that. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Studies, We've got studies on that. On, on I know, which I don't have the slides for. I, I'll just tell you the short version then. Basically, uh, taller people are more credible than shorter people, which sucks for me. Um, and so if you're in a taller telepresence robot, you are more persuasive. You can convince people of more things than if you're in a shorter robot, regardless of what your actual human height is. Um, so it's good for me because I can use tall robots and overcome some of this. But it's bad for me because in real life, all I can do is wear heels, and that only gets you like a few more inches. Um, but it's also why heels actually, the, they start, men were the ones who wore heels in the beginning because it's a power move to be taller than other people and to be over them. And we think this is not proven, but you know, evolutionary psychology's argument for that is that your parents are taller than you as you're growing up, and they're more cre they know more than you do when you're a kid. Um, and so as we get bigger, we sort of have that heuristic of taller is smarter. Um, also for the, the gestures, actually Dave, Nguyen, who graduated from here with John Kenny, um, did this really cool study where they either showed only the video conferencing face or they also showed the torso and arms. Um, and for people who saw the other person's arms through the video chat, um, that person would then come into the room in person. So I would leave the video chat, come over here, open the door, and accidentally drop a pen. Um, and they measured how quickly people got up to pick up that pen to help the person, which is a measure of like, you know, how much do you care about that other person? People who showed the, more of their body um, got more help more quickly. Um, and they had, you know, they self-reported more rapport and they talked to each other longer. So there are benefits of showing more. Um, actually, Eric, you had the little pointy stick, right? On your first, one of the early ones. You would do um, a lot of quick number of reviews too, but as much as you could at the time. Yeah, it's yeah. still kind of stilted for us. Yeah, but. it's really hard still. But I mean, even like you said, the height thing, that was a big issue. Yeah. At some point, it's almost done. There is too tall. Yes. Like yes. Totally. So I mentioned like we put these in preschools. We made one that was like this tall, which was great on the playground for parents to play with kids when the kids were bored. But it was terrible for PTA meetings where the parents would beam in and then talk to the teachers. 
because um, now the parent it looks like a toddler, mm -hmm. right? And you've just lost respect, really, um, for being that small. So it kind of depends on the use case, too. Um, we've also. You come into a room and everyone might sit down. Yeah. These are always at the same height. Yeah. It's always sort of going to be like if I just stood here during your talk. Like right. This. Right, right, except you get this like awkward type for Lars because ours is halfway between yeah. sitting and standing. <laughs> yeah, so. Pointing and gesturing, at least that was the idea. That yeah. We didn't really, we did explore. I know, um, like turning to people to help, helps with turn taking at least when there's a group of folks, right? Well, we know that from the autonomous robots literature too. If you look at like museums and F formations and all that stuff, it helps to show body orientation. It's just really awkward when like the only degree of freedom you have is this. I think it would help to have more. Um, having the up-down degree of freedom was too expensive for a real product, um, but other other products had it. You know, Jonathan yes, he was on my committee. Yeah, he's great, actually. Yeah, he has, as far as I know, he has done the most. Yeah. Uh, comprehensive study of robotics. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, on the robots, it's not like that. It's really awkward when you log in. Um, people just pop in, you're like, oh, hi. Uh, and the first like two minutes of those interactions are really awkward until you really get going and you know the person. The other part that's really awkward is ending the call. So you're like, okay, well, I'm running out of batteries. So I think I need to you know, go back. Oh, where's, how do I get to the charge? Oh, it's over here. Okay, good to see you. Hold on. I'll talk to you later. I can't find, where the hell is the button, right? And so it takes a really long time to like find your charging station <laughs> and, and plug. And it makes the social interaction really awkward. And there are lots of ways to do that better, including adding autonomy, um, which is what they've been doing now, right? You just say park. OK, we'll skip the rest of the studies, because this isn't the most fun. Um, I think, you know, I mentioned, I alluded to the, the palace, right? There's a ton of places that would be really cool to go that are just too hard or too expensive to get to, right? Not that you shouldn't go there in person if you can, um, but everybody talked about, like, I wanted the baseball stadium. I wanted the football stadium. I wanted the concert hall, the museum, the palace, um, so that I can go there with my friends, right, and heckle the players on the field with them. <laughs> so it's not about watching TV. It's about going there as a social activity and being part of the action and part of the audience more actively, um, which was, I think, really cool. So, right, I think, you know, a lot of people will tell me um, this won't work with older adults. And that might be true if we don't show any value, right? Um, if, you know, I'm not going to have patience with playing with your little tech unless you can show me that it does something useful for me. Um, and I think there can be value here. It needs to be communicated better through the design of the systems. But I think it could be done, not with the existing ones. They'd have to be redesigned. But I do think there is opportunity um, there. So. Uh, there's also a lot of work that needs to be done around etiquette, right? So like Uncle you asked, like, how do you tell people what this thing's supposed to be like? Same thing here. We kind of have to train etiquette into people. Um, so nowadays, when, the, when you park your beam, if you try to turn it off in the middle of the room, it'll say, you haven't put it in the charging station. You might want to do that, <laughs> right? And so kind of pushing people towards like what polite behavior would look like is good. Uh, and again, you know, making it easier to hang up. You just, nowadays, you drive the beam kind of within range of the charging station. You hit the P and hold it. And it'll autonomously go back to its dock um, so that you can spend time saying goodbye instead of spending time parking your robot. Um, there's a lot more studies that we're going to skip. And I'll just send you guys these papers if you want to see them. I think the last one that's good to just briefly mention uh, is this one. Um, are they robots? I think so, because now there's bits of autonomy in them. Um, we ran a study where, so we had a little Hokio laser on the base, and it was looking for obstacles. And people were just bad at driving these, so we thought it would help. Um, what we did in this study was we gave people obstacle avoidance or not, and we measured this personality dimension of whether they feel like they need to be in control of the future or they're just really willing to roll with the punches. Uh, and I'll skip to the punchline here. People. Hit fewer obstacles when you give them obstacle avoidance, which is a no-duh. But they actually took longer to finish the obstacle course when you gave them obstacle avoidance. Um, and it's these folks who are struggling. The people who need to be in control <laughs> are taking longer to use the obstacle avoidance. And this is statistically significantly different. These guys are way taller than these three. So these are people who need to be in control and have obstacle avoidance turned on. If they want to hit that table, they're going to hit that table. And if you don't let them, they're just going to keep trying to hit that table, right? And so there is a personality dimension that matters here. Like, not all humans are the same. <laughs> they do need to be adaptive. Um, and actually, personality changes over time. But um, I think you know, we need to take a bunch of human dimensions into account when we're designing these systems, especially as we're taking away control um, from people, which we're doing in a lot of our systems these days. Uh, we are going to skip two. Um, this is my new lab. You guys should come visit. And just in case you weren't tempted to come visit yet, um, these are awesome robots that have come and visited my HRI senior seminar. You could come bring your robots, um, or you could come in telepresence robot. Um, I actually teach really big courses, too. If you feel like talking to lots of people, you know what that's like here at Cal. Um, I just taught a 210 student research methods class so that we can help kids be more rigorous um, in ex their experimental designs. Um, lots of other fun folks come and visit. We have a guest lecture series in the psych department as well as in the HCI seminar. Bjorn just came and visited, and now he's surfing. So, you know, <laughs> if you come, you might be cool like Bjorn, too. Uh, and this is campus, in case you've never seen it. It's in the Redwoods. Like, everyone thinks of Santa Cruz as being like beaches and surfing, but really, our campus is <laughs> in a state park. It's beautiful. Totally come see it. If you don't want to drive Highway 17, I understand, because that thing is scary, and I just drove it now. 
Um, but if you want to come in telepresence robot, I've got a couple of them in my lab, and you can come that way too. So all you need is a laptop and an internet connection. So that's an open invitation, seriously, because our lab's just getting started. And we can go to the beach too if you come in person. All right, thanks. So I can stick around for questions if you want. Yeah. My, um, my daughter ran into the PR2 and one of the telepresence robots, whether it's Forge Flame or Maker Fair. Yeah, yeah. And she was scared to death of the PR2. Yeah, everybody she is. Would not leave the beam alone. Yes, every time I bring robots places, they're like, they just gravitate towards the beam because it's, it's just a person, yeah. right? The PR2 is kind of alienating. Uh, it's very capable, but it's also very alienating. And that's partially my fault. Like, it was scarier before I got there, uh, <laughs> but it's still scary. <laughs> Yeah, of so far, but there's going to be better. That thing was a step <laughs> in a direction. It's not all the way there yet. Yeah. Yeah. PR two. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I've been looking at maybe using a fetch, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's or maybe Curie when they finally ship. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You don't get the weird like, let's pick up the bottle like that, <laughs> and then give it to the person. Yeah, because that's no, it's not ergonomic. <laughs> Maybe like working out other muscles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. I do miss the PR too. <laughs> we can't afford one yet, but I'm working on that. Yeah. You're talking about adding autonomy to these. Uh, yeah. Presences and making them actual robots. Yeah. Um, so Slowly. Anyone out because you told them she is a person. Oh, yeah. So, from the local side, you can't tell what's autonomous, right? So, you can't tell that I cheated and hit P and just held it down to park. <laughs> uh, from the operator side, it can be kind of freaky. It's just like drivers of cars, right? Being freaked out about cars taking over. Really, like, I drive an e golf, and that thing is a computer on wheels. Like, all the buttons and things I hit are just suggestions to the computer about how it maybe should drive. Um, but it's deciding, right, for itself. Um, and I think, yes, there's going to be people who freak out. But I think also after you drive them a bunch, you realize that there's all these tedious things you don't want to deal with, like shifting gears on Highway 17 in traffic. I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, if you're on a racetrack, fine, I get it. But there's a lot of times when you don't, and it'd be good to add the bits of autonomy to deal with those parts you don't want to deal with. Yeah.